Hey everybody, what's happening? It is March 29th, 9.13 a.m. And you're in the morning devotion with Bo Willette, Bo O. So it's morning Debo with Bo O. And I get to go through the Bible because that's how I do it. Um, I actually go through the entire scripture and uh, just do my devotions that way. So it's kind of fun. A lot of people do their devotions kind of piecemeal all over. Maybe they have a book called like Upmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers, or they might have a different devotional book. I tend to just roll through the Bible and I get to air them and you guys get to hang out with me and just go through them. Of course, um, you know, 51 years old now, a Generation X guy, Southern California kid, surfing, not from a church background at all. And it's kind of weird how you're not from a church background. You don't hang out with Christians. You don't know the Bible. You don't know anything about God, really. You just kind of make things up as you go. Um, that's kind of what we did. Um, we kind of hear things a little bit and then kind of spout it out. But it's so fun just to um, learn, get into the Bible. And uh, certainly through that avenue of just reading the scripture, man, I felt in love with this Jesus guy. And uh, by the way, uh, Good Friday, you know, it is a, uh, uh, what do they call a solemn day, but also uh, an awesome day. Um, And when you know the scriptures and you read the Bible, Friday is good. You know, the, the day of Christ's crucifixion is a good day um, to know that your sins are being paid for through and through. And if there's anything we're learning in the book of Isaiah, which is now we're in the prophets, right? The book of Isaiah is that Israel needs a complete newness in their life. They have gone astray. They have backslid Judea, Judea, the southern kingdoms of Israel. And Jerusalem, its capital, the place where the temple stands, has been, in a sense, corrupted uh, just through the sins of the people. The land has been corrupted. And uh, and so that's kind of where we're at in the book of Isaiah. What's up, Bob? What's up, Mike? What's up, Paula? What's up? Uh, who else is there? Uh, Casey, what's happening on YouTube? Um, SSS? is also there. So what's happening to you as well? And thanks for joining. So we're going to be in Isaiah chapter four today. That's kind of where we're at. A little bit of my background. Here we go. Okay. So in chapter four, and again, a lot of our answers to questions are simply just by reading the Bible. A lot of us don't read the Bible and therefore we just don't really learn much about God and how God's dealing with people. So it says in that day, and it always talks about in that day, there's going to be a future day. That's what these kind of prophets are about. Uh, They're not only talking about the the present time, but they also uh, kind of talk about what's going to happen in the future. In that day, so few men will be left that seven women will fight for each man saying, let us all marry you. It's going to be a lack of dudes out. And this is the idea of, of the judgment that's going to happen against this land of Judea or, or Judah, right? The Southern kingdoms of Israel. You know, sometimes we have a, a, a famine in our own land, right? Meaning not so much a famine of food per se, but sometimes it's a famine of other things, right? We're kind of lacking in different areas. You know, maybe I'm lacking in humility. Maybe I got a famine. And when it comes to humility, uh, you know, a famine for compassion, um, uh, you know, those kind of things. Maybe there's a famine in my heart. That's what I mean by doing a devotion is really kind of pulling out what it's talking about in the text and applying it to your life. You know, it says in this day, there's going to be a judgment in Israel that's going to lead to a a lack of men, right? So it talks about all these women will be crying out to a man, let us marry you. We will provide our own food and clothing, only let us take your name so we won't be mocked as old maids. The idea of not being, you know, without children, without a a progeny, you know, which was pretty important in the land to have a piece of land, to have property, uh, and to have that go on and on. Something that in our society, we've kind of lost a little bit of um, 
uh, of a mind towards. Meaning a lot of people, when they look at kids, they kind of look down on it. Like, oh man, having kids is a bummer. They don't realize all the people in the past that have had children leading up to them. They don't, they don't, in a sense, they don't even respect the past. See, there was a woman and a man who, who came together and had you. And before that, there was other people that had them. And other people before that had them. And, and on and on and on it went, you know. <clears throat> and uh, I think in our day, we kind of, we diminish that. You know, we think it's not that important, <clears throat> which is kind of, uh, seems kind of weird. It says, but in that day, a branch, the branch, ooh, might want to underline that term in your Bible, but in that day, the branch of the Lord, gosh, that's kind of a weird thing, the branch of the Lord. I wonder if it's going to come up again. Yes, it will. The branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of all who survive in Israel. So there's going to be a judgment in Israel. There's going to be a um, a lack of men, probably because they're in war and they will die. And uh, it talks about that. But in that day, there will be a branch, which is very cool. There'll be this branch of the Lord that will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory. It'll, it'll, the land will be restored. There will be this branch that grows into something beautiful. And it says, all who remain in Zion, that's the place of Jerusalem where the temple stands. Those who survive the destruction of Jerusalem and are recorded among the living, the Lord will wash the filth from beautiful Zion and cleanse Jerusalem of its bloodstains with the hot breath of fiery judgment. God's judgment will do a cleansing work. We get this idea throughout the scripture, right? That when God comes on the scene, there is a cleansing work, a cleansing of dealing with sin. So God's judgment, God coming on the scene is always depicted scripturally as a time of beauty in the sense of the glory of God is there, but also in the sense of judgment because of sin. So God's glory is on the scene because his presence is there and God is glorious. He is perfect. He is righteous. But also the ramifications of his coming is also one of judgment because God cannot tolerate sin. God will have to judge it. And this makes sense to me. Like even me, atheist Bo growing up, right? Do I really want a deity that's like me? Do I want a de- do I want a God who is going to compromise righteousness? Is that what I was asking for? You know, and in a way it was. When I was making up God according to my own mind, just making him up, whatever I thought or what I didn't want to think about God. Whatever I had in my brain, I was just conceptualizing it according to my own thoughts. You know, making God in my image. And I certainly didn't want to make that God a righteous being, this glorious, just God, because then I knew God, I would have to be accountable to that God. See, if God is righteous, that means he's the right judge. You go into a courtroom and if you have a righteous judge, they're going to judge according to the law and it's going to be a righteous judgment. They're going to uphold the law. Well, God's going to, he is the perfect righteous judgment. So when judge, so when God comes on the scene, his judgments are thorough and they are precision and he will see right through our yuck. He will see right through our facade too, right? Our hypocrisy. And he will see us for who we really are. And when he when we are judged according to his law, law of perfection, how are we going to stand in the presence of that? We're not. And so it talks about this, the breath of fiery judgment, right? The idea of the consuming work of God. God will consume sin. He will, he will eat it up. 
he will devour it. it. That will be the judgment. So when God comes on the scene and when we cry out on the earth, where's God? Where's God? You know, why isn't God around? If God's real, why doesn't he show himself? We have no clue what we're talking about. We don't understand what we're, what we're, that we're dealing with a righteous God and abominable human beings. We have a far too high view of ourselves, right? And a far too low perception and conception of the deity. That's what we've done. We've exalted us and we've taken down God. And the revelation in chapter four is that God is going to wash the filth from Israel, from the temple area. He is going to do a cleansing work. He will provide, it says, a canopy of cloud during the day and a smoke of flaming fire at night covering the glorious land, and it will be a shelter from daytime heat and a hiding place from storms and rain. God is going to do a work of deliverance for the people of Israel, and it's seen in his presence. This is a uh, a picture of what we've seen in Exodus, where God is this smoke of flaming fire at night and this covering of glorious, this this covering or this cloud um, that's also seen as the presence of God. God doesn't show himself in his glory, in his, in, there's no image of God. That's the interesting thing about the Bible. And Jesus says, God is spirit. Right? There is no image that you can draw or anything like that. We shall not make any graven images. God's presence is seen in these this fire, in this cloud, something that is definitely not really drawable, not really known. You can't really, what is it? What is God look like? That kind of idea, you don't know, right? But I love the idea that God is going to cleanse and God is going to get rid of and God is going to, in a sense, wash us. Isn't this cool? This is kind of the promise of Isaiah. Remember that chapter one, though your sins be as scarlet, I will make you white as snow. That is the great hope in the book of Isaiah. And that is really the good hope for what? Good Friday is that there's a sacrifice that can really cleanse us of our sin. You know, what can really cleanse us of all of our sins? And this is, you know, how the great song is, right? What can wash away our sin, right? What's the answer? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? You guys know that tune for sure. But that's the idea is that what can really clean us of our filth? What can really provide shade? What can really give us that covering that we need, you know, to really deal with, you know, what is so evident in the world scientifically, right? And what is evident? What is evident is that humans are lost. That is the most evident thing of all, that we can't get it together, no matter what industry we build, no matter how much we try to help, we just create so many other things. It's amazing how many people we kill and we, we don't even know we're doing it. We make this, it kills people. We make that, it kills people. We, we allow this, it kills people, right? We go shop, we eat some food, and that's not doing good for us. It is unbelievable just uh, the wide range of mess we are in. If we don't know ourselves to be abominable, then what does that say about us, right? If we look at our world and we actually think we're not abominable, then, man, what does that say? You know, growing up in Southern Cal, you're always in kind of the hub of things, or I certainly seem to be. You know, friends would take me to Sunset Boulevard in the 80s. God, it was a heavy metal era. People packed in Gazzari's, the whiskey, uh, Coconut Teaser, uh, Roxy, you know, these places, and, you know, bands playing everywhere. And, and and then, you know, the rave scene in Los Angeles in the late 80s and early 90s. And, but always chaos, always so many crazy things going on, you know. It's hard not to grow up in that and go, man, our world is wild. 
It is an absolute. When we have more things to do, we get into more messes. That's what we do. And it's neat to know that God is not absent from our pain, but he comes into our world through the incarnation. And he does something, right? He makes a way for us to be cleansed. Jesus said, I have not come for the healthy, but I've come for the sick, right? Jesus has come to save us from our sins, right? Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, then you are free indeed. Free from what, you might ask? Free from the wrath of God, the judgment of God, this righteous God who will judge the world. That's why we come to Christ, because we have a very keen idea of our abominable situation, and we need salvation. And we need a God who is so able to cleanse us through and through, and we need a God so powerful to conquer what we cannot conquer, because we cannot conquer our sins, and we cannot conquer death. Those are things that dominate everything in us and outside of us. So we need a God who can take on human flesh within us and deal with what's in us and to deal with everything that's dying outside of us. And that is the God of the Bible. Unbelievable. Man, that is a a good Friday message in and of itself, is it not? He makes a way, he paves the way, he becomes the Passover lamb that takes away the sin of the world, and he does it in a human body. Wow. To deal with what we cannot deal with in our bodies. Mm. It's awesome. So the promise of restoration is one that we see in Isaiah 4, where we see this continual judgment on Judah and on Jerusalem, but we see a promise of restoration. This ultimately is going to be seen in the branch. And the branch is actually, the reason why I wanted you to underline it is because we're actually going to get the name of the branch later on in the prophets. His name is going to be Joshua. Interesting. Yahshua. That's going to be his name, Yahshua. And then, lo and behold, in the New Testament, someone is born who is called Yahshua. You might know him by the Latin derivative, Jesus. Interesting. The Bible is always honing in on who this incredible anointed one of God will be from the very get-go from the book of Genesis all the way threaded throughout it are a continual theme of getting closer and closer and closer to who the person is going to be that's going to conquer the work of Satan, death, sin, and restore fellowship with God. And we see here in Isaiah 4, the branch, right, is going to be a part of this restorative work of God to Israel. And we're going to see also included that that is the world. Wow. That was cool, cool, cool. Man, talk about a Devo. That was awesome. That was some good stuff right there. So, you know... A lot to be thankful for. Again, is the Bible super neat? Absolutely. Very, very cool, cool group of books. That's for sure. So you guys have a good day. Good Friday to Isaiah 4 in the books. We'll get into Isaiah 5 on the flip side. And then I go out to do some skiing. Mm, Go see my brother. So that'll be fun. We'll talk to you guys soon. Take care. Hope to see you tonight at Calvary Christian Fellowship, 6.30 p.m is the Good Friday service tonight, tonight, Friday. See you at 6.30. Bye-bye.